Imagine a world where nothing is random and major events that happen worldwide were written down hundreds of years ago. What you're about to hear was recorded in 1967 and it perfectly describes the world we live in today. It's a secret. The all-seeing eye. Symbols of the guardians of the treasure. Recorded by Myron C. Fagan, a famous Hollywood writer who rose through the ranks of the Hollywood elite, uncovering some nasty secrets along the way. He made it his life's work to expose the darkness that he personally saw with his own two eyes. This recording is a culmination of his life's work, and through a historical lens, he reveals what's been hiding in the shadows for hundreds of years. What you're about to hear is not conspiracy theory, rather, is documented historical fact that holds up to the most rigid scrutiny. And without further ado, I bring you the Illuminati in the Council on Foreign Relations. The question of how and why the Illuminati is the crux of the great conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of the United States and the enslavement of the American people within a UN one world dictatorship is a complete and unknown mystery to the vast majority of the American people. The reason for this unawareness of the frightening danger to our country and to the entire free world is simple. The masterminds behind this great conspiracy have absolute control of all of our mass communications media, especially television, the radio, the press, and Hollywood. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other two American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services, AP and UPI? Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer to handle in executive session. We all know that our State Department, the Pentagon, and the White House have brazenly proclaimed that they have the right and the power to manage the news, to tell us not the truth, but what they want us to believe. They have seized that power on orders from their masters of the great conspiracy. And the objective is to brainwash the people into accepting the phony peace bait to transform the United States into an enslaved unit of the United Nations One World Government. Let me clarify the meaning of the expression, he is a liberal. The enemy, meaning the One World conspirators, have seized upon that word liberal as a cover-up for their activities. It sounds so innocent and so humanitarian to be liberal. This satanic plot was launched back in the 1760s when it first came into existence under the name of the Illuminati. This Illuminati was organized by one Adam Weishaupt, born a Jew, who was converted to Catholicism and became a Catholic priest. And then, at the behest of the then newly organized House of Rothschild, defected and organized the Illuminati. Naturally, the Rothschilds financed that operation. And every war since then, beginning with the French Revolution, has been promoted by the Illuminati operating under various names and guises. I say under various names and guises, because after the Illuminati was exposed and became too notorious, Weishaupt and his co-conspirators began to operate under various other names. In the United States, immediately after World War I, they set up what they called the Council on Foreign Relations, 
commonly referred to as the CFR. And this CFR is actually the Illuminati in the United States. Perhaps the most vital directive in Weishaupt's plan was to obtain absolute control of the press, at that time the only mass communications media, to distribute information to the public so that all news and information could be slanted so that the masses could be convinced that a one-world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. Now do you know who owns and controls our mass communications media? I'll tell you, practically all the movie lots in Hollywood is owned by the layman's, Kuhn Loeb and Company, Goldman Sachs, and other internationalist bankers. All the national radio and TV channels in the nation are owned and controlled by those same internationalist bankers. The same is true of every chain of metropolitan newspapers and magazines, also of the press wire services, such as Associated Press, United Press International, etc. The supposed heads of all those media are merely the fronts for the internationalist bankers who in turn compose the hierarchy of the CFR, today's Illuminati in America. Now can you understand why the Pentagon's press agent Sylvester so brazenly proclaimed that the government has the right to lie to the people? What he really meant was that our CFR-controlled government had the power to lie to and be believed by the brainwashed American people. And let's again go back to the first days of the Illuminati. In 1785, the Bavarian government outlawed the Illuminati and closed the lodges of the Grand Orient. In 1786, they published all the details of the conspiracy. The English title of that publication is the original writings of the order and sect of the Illuminati. Copies of the entire conspiracy were sent to all the heads of church and state in Europe. But the power of the Illuminati, which was actually the power of the Rothschilds, was so great that this warning was ignored. Nevertheless, Illuminati became a dirty word, and it went underground. At the same time, Weishaupt ordered Illuminists to infiltrate into the lodges of Blue Masonry and form their own secret societies within all secret societies. Only Masons who proved themselves internationalists and those whose conduct proved they had defected from God were initiated into the Illuminati. Thenceforth, the conspirators donned the cloak of philanthropy and humanitarianism to conceal their revolutionary and subversive activities. And that all that secrecy emphasizes the power of the masterminds of the Illuminati to prevent such terrible events of history from being taught in our schools. In 1834, the Italian revolutionary leader Giuseppe Mazzini was selected by the Illuminati to direct their revolutionary program throughout the world. He served in that capacity until he died in 1872. But some years before he died, Mazzini had enticed an American general named Albert Pike into the Illuminati. Pike was fascinated by the idea of a one-world government, and ultimately he became the head of this Luciferian conspiracy. Between 1859 and 1871, he, Pike, worked out a military blueprint for three world wars and various revolutions throughout the world, which he considered would forward the conspiracy to its final stage in the 20th century. Again, I remind that these conspirators were never concerned with immediate success. They always operated on a long-range view. Pike did most of his work in his home in Little Rock, Arkansas. But a few years later, when the Illuminati's lodges of the Grand Orient became suspect and repudiated because of Mazzini's revolutionary activities in Europe, Pike organized what he called 
the new and reformed Palladian Rite, he set up three supreme councils, one in Charleston, South Carolina, one in Rome, Italy, and the third in Berlin, Germany. He had Mazzini establish 23 subordinate councils in strategic locations throughout the world. These have been the secret headquarters of the world revolutionary movement ever since. Long before Marconi invented radio, the scientists in the Illuminati had found the means for Pike and the heads of his councils to communicate secretly. It was the discovery of that secret that enabled intelligence officers to understand how apparently unrelated incidents, one such as the assassination of an Austrian prince at Sarajevo, took place simultaneously throughout the world, which developed into a war or a revolution. Pike's plan was as simple as it has proved effective. It called for communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment three global world wars and at least two major revolutions. The first world war was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to destroy Tsarism in Russia, as vowed by Rothschild after the Tsar had torpedoed his scheme at the Congress in Vienna, and to transform Russia into a stronghold of atheistic communism. The differences stirred up by agents of the Illuminati between the British and German empires were to be used to foment this war. After the war would be ended, communism was to be built up and used to destroy other governments and weaken religions. World War II, when and if necessary, was to be fomented by using the controversies between fascists and political Zionists. During this World War II, international communism was to be built up until it equaled in strength that of united Christendom. When it reached that point, it was to be contained and kept in check until required for the final social cataclysm. As we know now, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin put that exact policy into effect and Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson continued that same exact policy. World War III is to be fomented by using the so-called controversies, the agents of the Illuminati, operating under whatever new name, are now stirring up between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Muslim world. That war is to be directed in such a manner that all of Islam and political Zionism, Israel, will destroy each other, while at the same time, the remaining nations, once more divided on this issue, will be forced to fight themselves into a state of complete exhaustion, physically, mentally, spiritually, and economically. Now, can any thinking person doubt that the intrigue now going on in the near, middle, and far east is designed to accomplish that satanic objective? Pike himself foretold all this in a statement he made to Mazzini on August 15, 1871. Pike stated that after World War III is ended, those who will inspire to undisputed world domination will provoke the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. Quoting his own words, taken from the letter he wrote to Mazzini, and which letter is now catalogued in the British Museum in London, England, he said, We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people forced to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will be from that moment on without direction and leadership and anxious for an ideal but without knowledge where to send its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, 
brought finally out into public view, a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. When Mazzini died in 1872, Pike made another Italian revolutionary leader named Adrian Lemmy, his successor. Lemmy, in turn, was succeeded by Lenin and Trotsky, then by Stalin. The revolutionary activities of all those men were financed by British, French, German, and American international bankers, all of them dominated by the House of Rothschild. We are supposed to believe that the international bankers of today, like the money changers of Christ's day, are only the tools or agents of the great conspiracy, but actually they are the masterminds behind all of it. While the general public has been brainwashed by all the mass communications media into believing that communism is a movement of the so-called workers, the actual fact is that both British and American intelligence officers have authentic documentary evidence that international liberals operating through their international banking houses, particularly the House of Rothschild, have financed both sides in every war and revolution since 1776. Those who today comprise the conspiracy, the CFR in the United States, direct our governments, whom they hold in usury through such methods as the Federal Reserve System in America, to fight wars such as Vietnam, created by the United Nations, so as to further Pike's Illuminati plans to bring the world to that stage of the conspiracy when atheistic communism and the whole of Christianity can be forced into an all-out Third World War within each remaining nation, as well as on an international scale. Now let me show you how our federal government and the American people have been sucked into the one world takeover plot of the Illuminati Great Conspiracy. And always bear in mind that the United Nations was created to become the housing for that one world so-called liberal conspiracy. The real foundations of the plot for the takeover of the United States were laid during the period of our Civil War. Not that Weishaupt and the earlier masterminds had ever overlooked the New World. Weishaupt had his agents planted over here as far back as the Revolutionary War. But George Washington was more than a match for them. It was during the Civil War that the conspirators launched their first concrete efforts. We know that Judah Benjamin, chief advisor of Jefferson Davis, was a Rothschild agent. We also know that there were Rothschild agents planted in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet who tried to sell him into a financial dealing with the House of Rothschild. But old Abe saw through the scheme and bluntly rejected it, thereby incurring the undying enmity of the Rothschilds. Investigation of the assassination of Lincoln revealed that the assassin, Booth, was a member of a secret conspiratorial group. Because there were a number of highly important government officials involved, the name of the group was never revealed, and it became a mystery, exactly as the assassination of Jack Kennedy still is a mystery. Anyway, the ending of the Civil War destroyed, temporarily, all chances of the House of Rothschild to get a clutch on our money system, such as they had acquired in Britain and other nations in Europe. I say temporarily because the Rothschilds and the masterminds of the conspiracy never quit. So they had to start from scratch, but they lost no time in getting started. Shortly after the Civil War, a young immigrant who called himself Jacob H. Schiff arrived in New York. Jacob was a young man with a mission for the House of Rothschild. Jacob was the son of a rabbi, born in one of Rothschild's houses in Frankfurt, Germany. I won't go deeply into his background. The important point is that Rothschild recognized in him 
not only a potential money wizard, but more important, he also saw the latent Machiavellian qualities in Jacob that could, as it did, make him an invaluable functionary in the great one-world conspiracy. After a comparatively brief training period in the Rothschilds London Bank, Jacob left for America with instructions to buy into a banking house, which was to be the springboard to acquire control of the money system of the United States. Actually, Jacob came here to carry out four specific assignments. Number one, and most important, was to acquire control of America's money system. Number two, find desirable men who, for a price, would be willing to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into high places in our federal government, our Congress, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nations, particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target. The headquarters of the great conspiracy in the late 1700s was in Frankfurt, Germany, where the House of Rothschild had been established by Mayor Anselm, who adopted the Rothschild name and linked together other international financiers who had literally sold their souls to the devil. After the Bavarian government's exposure in 1786, the conspirators moved their headquarters to Switzerland, then to London. Since World War II, after Jacob Schiff, the Rothschild's boy in America, died, the headquarters of the American branch has been in the Harold Pratt Building, New York, and the Rockefellers, originally protégés of Schiff, have taken over the manipulation of finances in America for the Illuminati. In the final phases of the conspiracy, the one world government will consist of the king dictator, head of the United Nations, the CFR, and a few billionaires, economists, and scientists who have proved their devotion to the great conspiracy. All others are to be integrated into a vast conglomeration of mongrelized humanity, actually slaves. What you just heard was a very small piece of that recording. The full recording is well over two hours in length and is widely available online. Just Google Myron Fagan CFR or Myron Fagan Illuminati and you can find several versions of it. Please leave a comment below and tell us what you think about this. And also, don't forget to hit that like button. Until next time, thank you all for watching. God bless you all.